Um, Nina, please join me while they're putting up uh, the uh, the uh, next panel for us. Um, tell us a bit about your story. How did you start working with the drones? Uh, my name is Nina Kov and I'm a choreographer, a uh, researcher and uh, drone choreographer. I started working with drones uh, in 2011. I did a duet called uh, Copter for the Place Prize in uh, London. And uh, from then on, I uh, continued working with drones. And uh, my whole work with drones has been like uh, kickstarted by an EU project uh, that was called the FET Art, ICT Art um, Grants. And uh, I applied and had a residency in Budapest at the LT University at the Department of Biological Physics. So it was very interesting to have uh, the opportunity to work with, with real uh, scientists that uh, were studying collective motions. And they um, applied the laws of collective motion to a swarm of drones. Uh, so this is how it all, it all started. And maybe one very short question is also what you talked about beyond the project because often you do a project and then it's over and you're moving to something else but you actually were able to create something sustainable out of the project that there is a follow-up through the starts residencies. Yes, we did create a startup, a spin-off uh, from the university and the startup based on the, this collaboration uh, and uh, uh, we funded a project called Dancing with Drones that is still based in Hungary. I'm now working freelance on drone projects like this um, all around the world and I'm looking forward to actually, uh, this, this was the premiere of, of this piece that was commissioned special for this, uh, this day and I'm looking forward to continue working with drones and uh, with my producer, Andrea Kovac, from uh, Let It Be Art, who uh, helped us uh, put this all together. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Good luck. Continue. <laughs> um, and off we go for the next session. The next session is called Why Culture and How uh, and If Arts and creativity can spur innovation and growth. And I actually have decided I'm going to change the title. It's not if they can it, but how they actually do it. And um, spur innovation and growth. Um, and for this, I have a very distinguished panel uh, to moderate. So I call on stage, please, one after the other. So the first one is Anna Waltonen from Finland. Please join me. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, then Horst Hörtner von Ars Electronica. Welcome. Uh, Johan Fanise from France. Christina Hack from Berlin. Then Miklos Bott from Hungary, here from Budapest. And last but not least, Michaela Magash, please join me again for this panel. Okay, so that's it, madam. So, what we're going to do here now, here, um, I'm going to take you through some, uh, some questions one after the other and introduce the speaker then as far when I ask the question. And then after a short while, I will actually turn to you because this is also your space and your floor. So when I look at you and when I think yes, now we go for the question, you can start thinking if there is something certainly also from Michaela's presentation before. There will be lots of questions, I hope. So please then also raise your hand, uh, tell us what, what your name is and where you're from and then if possible, to whom you'd like to address the question. So. Um, quick uh, framing of the conversation while we're here also is that we have experienced um, on the European level but also on the local and regional level quite an increase of attention and awareness about the potential of the culture and creative industries and culture more generally. We often refer to um, sort of culture moving up the political agenda and being much more considered now as a strategic asset for Europe. And related to this, to this political awareness, we have also seen then a whole range of new funding stream um, uh, being put in place. So we have some experience, some in Creative Europe, 
for example, to a small but still important degree, we have seen um, some funding stream in the current Horizon 2020 programs, also some calls for cross innovations of the CCIs, and um, also, and that's a very good, uh, very good perspective, is in the future Horizon research program, Horizon Europe program, there is a dedicated cluster dealing with uh, culture, creativity and inclusive societies. And I think it's very important to have the inclusive society reference there. However, uh, this could give the impression that we are very well uh, supported, funded and, and so forth, but actually there is still a lot to be done and a lot of challenges that the current uh, policy framework and the current funding framework do not properly address. So what we're going to do at this panel is trying to identify ways from your very personal experience how to overcome these challenges and these bottlenecks and then also complete com uh, immediately feed into a possible future kick. So I'd like to one, focus on your personal experience, and secondly, be very also pragmatic in terms of um, a future kick. Um, and to start uh, this round of and this conversation, I hope, uh, Anna Waltonen, you are Vice President of Art and Creative Practices in Alto University. I learned that means WAVE and not related to Alva Alto. Um, and uh, your university has been actually set up to spur innovation in Finland and by bringing arts, technology and business communities together. So very relevant, of course, for this theme. And I'm particularly interested in how culture and creative skills trigger innovation across the board, so not only within the culture and creative sectors, what are the, the spillovers and the interaction with the other sectors, and how you have witnessed impact on other sectors of economy, please. Thank you. Like you mentioned, the Alta University, to me, it's a little bit like a prototype of what a university could be. We're trying to find new ways of thinking around these areas. Um, and we have combined exactly the areas you mentioned. We have technology, we have business, and we have art and design and architecture together. And Vivian Hoffman earlier talked about having the importance of having the deep skills in each of these areas, and, and we do. So, for example, in art and design and architecture, the QS currently ranks as a seventh in the world, so there is the deep knowledge is there. But more importantly, it's really about what can we do across and how can we all think mm. in a more creative way, in new ways of working. And I think that's really where it becomes interesting. So in addition, when we say that we want to do research that really has societal impact and educate game changers, I think we need to have two of these transversal skills that you were mentioning earlier. One, of course, is entrepreneurial skills. I think many of you have been talking about those. But the other part is really how can we be more creative? How can we think in a completely new and different way? Uh, and to me, it's not only what we do with the academia alone, but that's why I also think that Aldo is a little bit of like the EIT in a mini format, because we also try to grow the whole ecosystem on campus, everything from young to old to companies to startups and so on. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about why I think this is so important after we've seen a very short video about what the university is to get us all hopefully into the spirit of this thinking. Click up. change and how can we really achieve it and I think there's three main things that we all need to take in consideration no matter what kind of an organization we are uh, 
one, we really talk about the creativity as a different kind of perspective into the challenges we have ahead of us today. So we have new challenges. I don't think we can reach uh, brilliant solutions only by doing things as we have done before. Mm. And part of it is really the diversity question. We have proof that when we include the creative industries, we actually also increase diversity at large uh, when it comes to whatever gender, fields, age, nationalities, and so on. So we all th need to think differently, I think, in, in the challenges we have today. Uh, the other part of the discussion that we haven't really touched too much about today is if we want to be competitive in Europe, we need to make sure that every single one of our organizations, whether they are companies or municipalities and so on, are actually competitive and cutting edge. Um, and that's, I think, where we can really have much of the creative industries help and being part of, of where each and every one of your innovation agenda is going. And we talked a lot about the different kinds of kicks. Um, I think that when we talk about the creative industries, we talk a lot about the human aspect, and we talk about the experimentation, we talk about trying new things. Um, and I don't think there are many technological solutions or business solutions that work without any of those components. So mm. I think working together is really what, what brings us there. And then the third part that I haven't heard too much about today, which I'd really like to put forward, and also from a very, you talked about a personal experience. Mm. Today in Europe, we have a challenge of, uh, we need to be the most innovative, but also the best place to be in the world. Um, we have a situation where I think it's increasingly important that, that more and more of our people actually engage in what we do, that we feel strongly about it, that we have uh, the commitment to it. And I think this is also one where completely new ways, particularly from the creative industries, can be very fruitful. So talking about new kinds of ways of engaging citizens in our thinking, talking about the importance of, of making solutions that actually touch people, that people relate to, that engage them in a completely new way. And this is, I think, one of the areas where Europe has a unique strengthness of the whole heritage of, of we are the place where you know, humans matter, we have a strong cultural place in the world. And if I look forward, if we really embrace this, if we really empower it, in the same way, I, I was happy to see Michaela show example of how our students have formed Slush, a completely new in community to create new ventures. I think we as Europe can multiply that and do that kind of solutions by far bigger if we just come together and think about it out of creative viewpoints. Thank you, Anna. That makes a perfect bridge to you, Horst. Um, regarding the question of how to involve citizens actually in creative thinking and in this kind of also passion that you are about. I mean, about this bridging these different sectors and the arts electronica, I think, is a fascinating place. I mean, we often tend to forget that it was in 79 already at sort of at the intersection of art, technology and society. So here the people first, it's about the people and not and not the necessarily the, the, the market, but of course the part of the market and their contribution can, um, can happen in all kinds of ways. But maybe you, you Horst, you could, you could elaborate um, on your experience if we look at Ars Electronica Future Lab, which is a sort of R&D facility where you work with scientists, uh, media artists, you're yourself a researcher and media artist, um, and the notion of um, disruption, because disruption is a world we have also heard several times today already. It's a kind of buzzword. We need to be disruptive. We need to be, dis you know, in your context, how do you, how do you see the relationship between being disruptive and constructive at us Electronica? Thank you for that. Uh, well, I think there is a very, very close... Can I have to switch also to go through the PowerPoints? Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could bring up my slide, thank you. Um, there's a very strong connection between cultural uh, um, and, and, and disruptive innovations, I think. I mean, especially because technology is culture, is part of our culture, and it's not like dedicated to um, the industries or the science or the rest 
um, that is outside the culture. And also culture is shaping our technology. We clearly have left our fingerprint on the planet. And everybody would agree that not a single person would be able to solve the major challenge, <laughs> challenges that we are focusing at the moment, like climate change and migration flows, etc., etc. All those challenges need the transdisciplinarity, which has been brought up by you very nicely already, and the EIT program in general as well. But even if we would manage to have all the scientists and all the engineers and all the research labs working together, they would come up, they would probably find even a solution, but they would not be able to create the solution as we need the rest of the 8 billion to join in as our society needs to create, to work through, to participate in creating this solution. But how do we communicate these scientific findings to our society. Mm -hmm. We need an open and transdisciplinary and accessible science. And we need to communicate the meaning of disruptive innovation to our society, to our cultures, to our institutes. Very much as what Michaela has shown with the seven-year-old girl being fascinated because of having access to the infrastructure. This is fundamental, uh, important to our culture, to our uh, society. We humans are uh, curious. The notion of the vision being based on the needs and the needs being based on the technologies leads to the fact that we invest um, most of our money into the technologies and disruptive innovations, which I see is a shortcoming. Because if you look at the lifespan, the technology is gone in a year. The needs are changed in the next decade. What's left is the vision. And we have a very nice tradition in Europe of creating cultural-based um, visions that would last for several hundred years. Technology is culture. And culture is shaping our technologies. And if it's not, we might end up with technologies that we are not into. And I would even say that we need not only a kick for culture sectors, we need the culture, we need the arts in every uh, kick that is out there. It is very important to communicate our European cultural values to the, uh, to the world. And I think this is one status of competitiveness, if you want to say so, as a counter-proposal to the United States digital capitalism and the Chinese digital totalitarianism. It is the European digital humanism. And this is what we should fight for. Yeah. Thank you, Horst. A very good bridge also to you, Yuan. Uh, the link between uh, creating something meaningful and focusing on technology that had meaning for the human and, and fosters also human development. You are doing, you are co-creator or co-founder of Digits Arcs, video games um, in France. You are a success story, I would say, in terms of video gaming. I mean, I, I uh, was reading a bit about the games that you have been producing, like Lost in Harmony, two million players played across the world, Violent Hearts, uh, uh, same, same success story, Memories Retold, video games one-to-one. -one. So a whole set of um, very, very extremely meaningful and successful products. Um, and that you access globally, so beyond Europe as well. So I'm, I'm interested in how y you decided in your bio, you wrote something. At some point, I decided to focus on meaningful video gaming and how that decision actually contributed to you, to your personal success as a video gamer. Uh, maybe we can see first the... the yes, and there's the, cl the clicker here.
The first time you see someone die, everything shuts down. You're left with thoughts that go round and round. Every man has his demons. So uh, we, we don't have time to show the, the full video. Uh, so this is the last game we, we made with uh, Artman, the famous uh, British studio uh, behind Wallace and Gromit and all those movies. Uh, so as you can see, this is a European collaboration. Uh, and we also worked with Europeana um, uh, structure for the historical part. Mm -hmm. So that was truly a European collaboration. Uh, and that was normal for a World War I uh, game, for sure. Uh, so yes, this is very... Uh, we, I, I think we are lucky to be successful and uh, meaningful at the same time. But it was f first to be meaningful and then maybe because of that it became successful and not the opposite. So uh, I think this is, I know it's more to talk about business here and, and numbers. Uh, we are not much on that side, but uh, the, the good news is that uh, I, I believe that if you focus on the content, on, the, the, on what you do, uh, then the, the numbers will follow uh, and make it sustainable in a way. So uh, I, I think uh, for everything we do, it's important to, to keep that in, in mind. Do you want just to give a bit of more background to this? Because what I found really interesting is the, kind of the storytelling element and yeah, how well to <laughs> use the, the, the technology for the storytelling. Yeah, this is, well, this is the more personal part. Uh, but this could be a, any of you, I guess. It's just one day I, I told to my grandmother that I, I wanted to work on a World War I uh, video game to talk about war differently. And, and then she came back with all the letters of my uh, her father, my great grandfather, who fought during World War One, but like many others. And and when I was reading all those letters, it became uh, obvious that we have to talk about war in a different way than uh, all other video games. Of course, uh, I was making games for a long time already, and I, I was uh, surprised that you know video games and war. It's a certain type of games. <laughs> And uh, it was obvious that we need to make at least one game about war that was uh, different. Mm. So that was the, the, the purpose of that adventure. And I think the, the whole team uh, uh, became very passionate about the subject. And, and a lot of them uh, did some research about their family and what happened. Uh, because it's not a, a very famous uh, era of time. So yeah, that was very interesting also for the team. Yeah. And can I ask you, did, for example, in the educational system, did they show any interest? I think this would be perfect. Yeah, and uh, this is the thing with video game. This is the middle of everything because uh, we are uh, by itself uh, trans, how you say, transdisciplinary <laughs> because we, we mix the, the, the programmer, the artist, the musicians. We mix all of those fields together. This is not easy, of course, because those are very different people. But when you manage to make them communicate well and understand each other, then some, some things happen like that. So it's a very uh, interesting challenge. And also it's a, another challenge is to bring it to another level than just making games for entertainment. So this is why those type of games now are called uh, beyond entertainment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have already some questions while we have our three speakers here, the first three one? Is there anything, anybody who has a specific questions now already? No? Yes. Thank you. Please. There is, uh, the mic is coming. It's a very difficult to see. Hello. The impact on the... Can you, excuse me, can you just na tell your name Nelly and where Gay you're from? from France. And uh, it was just to repeat your question. Uh, what was the um, reaction? What was the impact on the educational system in France, for example? Ah, for, for those games? Uh, for this video game oh on yeah. the World War. Uh, they, they, are, they are used now, uh, they are used in school, in university. Uh, we still have to figure out the legality of it because sometimes there's, you know, IP and all those copyright issues. Uh, but basically, every time someone asks me, can I use your game in my class? I say, yes, of course, <laughs> you can. And I honestly, I don't ask the, the, the IP holders. Another one right now. No, I can't. No. Not yet. Be prepared. <laughs> okay.
Thank you, Johan. Christina, Christina Hack, you are Vice President of the Deutsche Museumsbund, the German Museum Association. You're also the Deputy Director General um, of the uh, Berliner Staatsmuseen, the State Museum of Berlin, which I learned are 15 museums, 17 collections, over 750 staff, so very big institution. And, and um, the question here I have is that very often in the public real museum uh, can be perceived, I don't say they are, and I don't think they are, but can be perceived as rather traditional, um, maybe a, a bit on the conservative side. And, and at the same time, I know in your case, for example, the, your personal experience, you were in charge of the digital transformation within this kind of rather institutional heavy machinery. So I'm, I'm interested to hear from you, um, um, how do you feel that the new technologies have disrupted the field of cultural heritage and museum? Um, thank you. Can we hear me? No. Maybe there's another one. Yeah. We can share. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, it's a, I think it's a prejudice that we are traditional and conservative. In some way we are, yes, because usually in Germany there are quite old institutions, um, the museums, and, um, but maybe first of all let me give you some more numbers or facts um, concerning our museums in Berlin. So there are about five million objects in our collections, five million objects um, from about 6,000 years all over the world, cultures from all over the world on one hand. Um, we have three point million visitors in our museums per year. We make about 80, 80 publications. We make about 120 exhibitions per year. If you take these numbers, I think there's a great potential for mm. the creative industry to be partners, to be together. That's the first statement. Um, the other part is you asked for digital technology. Um, it's not for me, it's not a disruption, but it's um, if you look back about 10 years, museums practice, for about now 10 years, you can't imagine museums work without digital tools because all, all of our parts we are acting in, like um, managing the collections, documentations, education, uh, publication, research, etc., etc. We always have to do with uh, digital tools. So for me, it's a process and not a disruption. But there are still some challenges for institutions like mine. Um, first of all, we, we, start, we have to start inside to change the digital mindset um, because most of my curators and directors um, use the digital tools for just one purpose, mm -hmm. but not, um, for, for example, for research, to make a database, etc. But what I mean to, cha to change the digital mindset is um, to start from the beginning to ask, what do you need, uh, for what do you need the databases also, for example, um, the images, we have about 7 million images of our objects in the institutions and it's, they are not only used for, for researchers, but what about the public and what about uh, school classes, etc., etc. And so, yeah, and always one challenge is also the money, of course, because um, digital technology is a quite dynamic sector and we usually don't have the money to change, for example, every half year, the technical equipment. Mm. And very important also that you mentioned the kind of cultural tourism dimension and how museums are actually main players mm -hmm. in, this, in the cities. Also, like if we talk about Berlin, yeah. you know, this attracts massive uh, numbers of people who are actually also coming for the cultural heritage, the cultural collections and so forth. And cultural tourism is... Not, not mm -hmm. only for not culture, uh, not also, sorry, not also, but usually the tourists don't come for the industry. They come because of cultural parts, like theatre in Berlin is very important, um, and the museums, etc. Yeah. yeah. And we are World Heritage also, yeah. so the museum island itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what I meant is you are actually part 
of it. So they don't come for it, but actually you're part of the contributors of the creative economy. Of course. So, yeah, that's the bridge. Um, are we doing fine on time now? Not yet. Yeah, very good. Uh, I think I recognize, is this Bernd Fiesel? No? Yes? yes. Please? There's the mic coming. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Isabel. My name is Bernd Fiesel again from the European Creative Business Network. My question uh, relates uh, to, the, to the object, to the sectors we are indeed speaking about. Creative industries, uh, you get the idea it's about industrial activity. But uh, most of the creative industries are small companies. They don't really go industrial. They may go large in scale. So um, I wonder, and I would like to have your perception on this, what kind of innovation are we talking about when we're talking of high impact innovation? How do we include uh, the diversity of the sector and the potentials in those small companies um, beyond the effects we need, of course, of the big corporates you have been giving the example about, but I think um, the small ones is just as important. Trust. Who would like to answer? Host? Anna also, maybe. I would like to give an example. I would like to give an example on um, innovation that is really coming from the cultural sector and um, and has a spectacular history to it that was Joachim Sauter inventing uh, Google Earth in mm -hmm. 1995 and he actually has won the IP um, um, battle with Google. It's just not known. Joachim Sauter is a very famous uh, Berlin-based artist, media artist, uh, and he has driven, he has started this idea of connotating our globe in, as I said, the mid-90s. Um, and luckily he was, he patented this idea as well. So this, this is one example. There's many, many others, contributions from Van Gogh TV in the 80s, revolutionizing the notion of interactivity on, on TV and so on and so forth. But it's less about uh, the the big icebergs um, or the tops of mm -hmm. the icebergs that we see, it's actually the fundamental change of cultural activities that change the culture towards um, an innovation readiness in our society. Uh, that's what you can see throughout the 40 years uh, uh, in Linz, to what Ars Electronica has done to Linz, for example, there was one um, and I'm finishing with this last sentence, uh, that there was one questionnaire done by the, um, by the EU on the cities of 200,000 citizens, and Linz is among those, it's just 200,000 citizens, in 2006 asking about the, the fear or, or the, you know, looking forward to the future, their own future, the citizens in those cities. And of all the cities, only Linz was the one which didn't have any fear. Uh, and they were totally looking forward towards the future. I'm not saying that's because of the Ars Electronica. I'm saying that's because it is a culture uh, in, in Linz that is very much innovation ready. And Anna, maybe I think you on the question of diversity and inclusivity. Yes, and on the question of the small companies within yeah. the creative sectors. Um, I think that's one of the other stereotypes that we are touching here, just like museums would be conservative. Mm. I think there is, a, there is a stereotype that the uh, different organizations within the creative fields would not want, or that, that they are small, that they don't understand business and so on. Um, I can see it quite differently out of our ecosystem. I think the, the small players in the cultural sector, they want to be successful just as much, mm. and we help them to be so, but they can be successful in different means. Some actually want to grow, but I don't think that linear growth is the only value we have in society today. So we also have many of the entrepreneurs which really push impact in completely new ways as well, and I think this is equally important. And then the other part which we are also only touching on here is when we have an ecosystem of, of startups, for example, they take the cultural sectors as players as a completely natural part of when they form 
any startup in the air in, in any area and I think this impact is even bigger and something we shouldn't forget so I'm sorry for fighting stereotypes here but I think it's it's really pushing value not being delimited by it thank you very much Miklos are you ready Miklos Wurz, so um, you are a um, performer, you are a composer, you are a songwriter, but you're also an ethnograph. And I learned that you have uh, composed a quite extraordinary project, the Polyphony project, which is a bridge builder, I would say, between past traditions and uh, how to bring it to the public realm, how to make it accessible, how to create conversations, also between different cultures, which I found interesting. And you started uh, doing this um, collection, this archive uh, collection in Ukraine with the biggest now online archive collection. But in the meantime, it brought you to Iran, to China, to Russia. Now, yesterday we talked about Belarus as well. Tell us a bit more about the project. I think what is it also relates. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's also uh, important information. When I was a young artist, uh, I all the time felt that I need new inspirations. And this is what we have in Europe, in especially in the eastern part and uh, east uh, central part of Europe, uh, that in the village there is still living tradition. And what was for me very surprising, that if you just grow up and what is surround you, the music which is coming from the radio, is something very different. I felt that I'm very bored for this. And I seek really new information and and, and transformative learning method to going directly to the villages and, and then finding something totally different mindset. Then you have to understand that all of this, uh, what you can, for example, find in the Hungarian gypsy uh, musicians or also in Romania and so on. So this way of thinking about music and creating melodies is something really different what we can hear uh, in radio and this is um, also the problem that how to connect with this different type of musical languages. And when I started uh, this, one of my first uh, expedition, it was really a life changing because everything what I hear, everything what I see is just, just made me thinking that how we can change our way of thinking about music. And in that moment, actually every year I spend some weeks or even months to recording different type of folk music. In the beginning, just only for myself to have inspiration. But later on, I j just start to feel that, that actually we have to create a huge database and, and just publish everything to the people as well to actually give us some kind of, kind of connection and inspiration as well uh, to the others. So I think um, what is very important as well, it was a very interesting topic what you're also talking about, but also we have to uh, have very good quality information from the past because uh, one of the European competitive advantage is actually this kind of rich, intangible and tangible uh, cultural heritage as mm. well. And so this is the reason why we created um, this um, polyphony project. You will see that actually, in if you, you can see a little tiny uh, knowledge triangle actually in the, in the project because uh, there will be also education, uh, some business part and also some research uh, part. I have a little video, please, can you project it? A few features from the, from the project. one of the educational thank you one of the educational background and now you will see uh, we recorded something like 130 villages 5000 songs and as you see uh, the first part what you sh what you see this is actually about education now lot of people universities also high schools but the people at home if they are ready with the work they sit down and try to learn the folk song in that way that they turn on only one person and he, and he or she start to sing together with the person and as you, as you can also see, we really focusing to the visual part. So it's state of the art technology, also the cameras and also the, the audio part. And we really want to give a touch of art. What actually Horst very nicely said, it's so important to give, uh, 
to place for association, to, to emotion connection for the material. Because it's already very strange that the European culture, folklore tradition, is more, uh, more in the distance than, for example, the, the American radio music. This is very interesting, this uh, type of problem. So, and here you see actually one of the most things which is gives us the company the revenue actually. This is the software, because in the company it's, there is a massive IT sector. And they created actually a software which is all of this uh, collection can be actually published and handling. And this is now what uh, we are cooperating with the Hungarian Academy of Sciences to, to actually rebuild the whole software and the digital part. And it's also good for researcher because it's really uh, filtering and you can searching and you can do a lot of researches. You see here is the multiplayer, which is actually you can, this one song you can now turn on and off and geolocation and whatever. So, um, and this is all of the project where it was recorded. So what I want to say that that also the software, when we created in the, in the beginning, we didn't thought that it will be uh, attracting so much attention from other museums, institutes and so on. And now we have a lot of uh, requests in working a lot also in Africa and also in Europe that we actually rebuild the whole databases of institutes and so on. So altogether, the project is focusing, if you open the, the website, is focusing also for the researcher, but for the common people. Hundred thousands of people listening this music at home because we, they have good quality materials. And this is how we can have uh, creating potential for the European culture in the future and in the innovation. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful, I really like also how you're creating new kinds of conversations. I think uh, what is really interesting is how you're also curating new kinds of conversations. And also you mentioned the touch of art, but also the sense of pride. Yes. With these different communities coming to you. So really fascinating progress. And you answered my question even without me asking it, to do how a kick would benefit this kind of project, because you have to mention it yourself. So, uh, so as you see, uh, I think really the, the, the this kind of construction, what we're talking about, Nolan's Triangle, really force people to cooperate. Mm. And it's very important, I think. And we have two minutes left. Two questions. Please, Elisabetta Lazzaro. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your testimonials. They are terrific. Uh, I mean, one example better than the other. Um, I know that in this panel we are not really uh, openly developing this aspect, but uh, which is the business uh, component. Um, uh, but still, I would like to know in your experience, concrete experience, what have been uh, uh, good examples and bad examples in dealing with uh, the business, especially commercially oriented. That's maybe for Michela. No? <laughs> so, Elisabetta, come again. So, basically, uh, what you're asking is how does it impact business or how does it manifest itself in business? How do we work with business? That's, that's more the question. So, as culture and creative industries, you mean how do we work with various... You, you have a mic? Sorry. Please, please. I'm just trying to, to clarify where, where she's, uh, what she's aiming at. The focus of the question is how the creative industries could intensify their work with business? Mm. No, I want it to be more concrete and more uh, uh, case-related. So in your uh, daily experience also with these uh, tremendous projects... Uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe it's a project-related. Can you elaborate a little bit more on... Uh, uh, possible uh, uh, experiences with the business partners uh, mm, that you one might have? One person? Christina, I think, because we had a second. Christina? Maybe I start, maybe I start with the conservative side. Um, for us, it's very, very important that we as museums also have an impact on that. Not only you or the creative industry uses our objects for inspiration that's great that's the first step but what is my impact for as a museum because sometimes we have it that um, our partners said well give us the images of the objects 
and that's it. And I have to say, the images of my object are my gold. Um, so I would like to have a win-win situation, um, and I would like to have be partners on, on the same level. So that's not a real exact example, but that happens quite often that we should give the images and, yeah, and have nothing back. Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Paul Coyle. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurial Mindset Network. So I was thrilled to hear two of the speakers at least uh, use the word mindset when they were uh, giving their comments. I'd like to ask the panel, uh, in your experience in the disciplines you're working with, do we have enough people with the right mindset? And do we need to change our mindsets? And that would be the concluding question. I think one answer from each of you. Very quick to this question. Please. Okay, do we have enough of the mindset to the question? Uh, the answer, short answer is no. I think, of course, we need all need to change our mindset on a daily basis, but that is exactly where the creativity and the creative industries come into the picture. We can actually be part of that puzzle of how we can all think differently in our everyday. And I think coming back to, to your question on the business part, that's also why it's relevant. So our startups, they don't use the creative industries because they would be interesting in any kind of field of industry as such. It's because it's better business. It's because it's better research. It's better and new approaches to anything you are working with in your own field. And that's why it makes sense. Thank you. Um, Three words. Ars Electronica Future Lab. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> I, I try yeah, to be super why, why, short. Why I we will have, have to be really rude. It's because there's the innovation tour. And okay. So, I have a good example and Five a bad minutes, example, so and I'm happy to explain that when we have more time. <laughs> <laughs> you and uh, Coming back to the business part, maybe, uh, it's very interesting because uh, small companies uh, struggle in video games, uh, of course, uh, because there is not enough funding from the public uh, industry. Uh, if you compare the video game funding and the, the media funding for movies and, and audiovisual, it's very different, as now video game is the number one entertainment activity in the world, so we have to find a way to balance it. Uh, specifically, if we don't want the private companies to really like own the video game field and only finance uh, games like uh, the one that was mentioned, uh, it's still a very nice company, but it's just like moving candies. So <laughs> it's different. So if we want to do that, we, we need uh, Europe and, and the countries to help for sure to fund. And uh, because right now, the, the, mo the movie you just saw, uh, our game was funded by a Japanese company. So. Mm. We have questions to ask uh, why. Is it a Japanese company? And right now, uh, the, the only partner who ask me are mostly Chinese or Americans. So this is also something yeah. we, we have to tackle. Yeah. Christina. No. Miklos. Mikela, I'm sure. Um, Please. I'm, uh, I'm going to do... I'm going to give you two answers to this. One is a pragmatic one, and one is perhaps coming from the point of view of a bigger vision. The pragmatic one is, if you create a particular kind of environment that incentivizes a different mindset, including how you manage people's intellectual property in the ecosystem, how do you manage their data, how do you ensure rights, security, privacy that it are democratic, where everybody gets a slice of the pie, then the mindset changes with it. So that's the pragmatic side, and this is something that we're very much working on. And I really um, uh, hope that EIT, and we're coming back to EIT, because mm. we've, been, we've been kind of having a wonderful journey sort of here. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by some of these projects. But I think we rolling it back to EIT, KIC, I think it has a phenomenal opportunity to test drive these. On the visionary side, um, we have a cocktail of three things, which I always say, and it sort of comes back to host digital humanism as well. Uh, three things in Europe, strong industry, strong creativity, which we export all over the world, and social conscience. We, from the visionary point of view, accept that these are the three that make us unique. 
then from that point of view, we can change our mindset as to what we stand for in Europe. Perfect ending. Thank you very much, Michaela. Thank you to all our panelists. Please join us in a big hand. Thank you so much. Please, uh, I may invite you to go back to your floor. And I have one, I think, if they, from all of these ideas and very concrete suggestions, there is one, I think, which relates to the mindset and EIT's uh, proposals and ambition, I think, something that Horst mentioned, I think, very, very importantly. It's not about necessarily creating a singular kick, as important it is to have a culture and creative industry kick, but it's actually about mainstreaming culture across the different kicks. I think this is something that maybe the IIT can be thinking about exploring in the future. Voila. And now it's time, actually, we, we are already at the end of that part of Innovate. And for this, I'd like to invite the director of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, Martin Kean. Please come on stage to share your reflections, your learning, <laughs> and what you're going to do with it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Much, Thank Isabel. you. And uh, well, belated welcome from my side, of course, to all of you. Um, I would like to start to thank very much, first of all, our speakers and panelists that we had here today. Um, and it's a bit early actually to draw conclusions right now because we're only halfway through the event. Um, so still the EIT Awards and the Innovation Tour to come. But what I would like to do is to see what are the takeaways we can take from this first session. So last year we focused Innovate very much backward looking at the first 10 years and what we have achieved. So I'm not gonna repeat that. I think EIT has now its established place in the European innovation landscape with great results, great numbers, and you've seen some of those and we'll see some of them now in the innovation tour. But today's first part was really about the future of the EIT and what is in the strategy proposal, especially for the European Commission. So I want to pick up some of the elements and also see what can be some of the challenges that we may face taking these new elements forward. I will start with the first one, which is about the culture and creative industries, um, the idea of having a kick in this field. I couldn't agree more to what Isabel just said, that that's a valid theme. I think all the discussions today brought out how much innovation potential there is and how much this area can not just contribute uh, for a kick in itself, but could actually cross-feed um, all the other innovation communities that already exist. So that can be a tremendous and really, really rich addition to the EIT as a whole. The challenge I see are two from the discussions we had today. First of all, how do we channel all this creativity, artistic value, all the different ideas that exist into the EIT model? So into a model that really is focused on the societal challenges, because really that's where we want the innovation to happen, to help us to tackle the climate change, sustainable energy, health, and all the other issues we have. So I think that will be one of the big challenges here to do that. Secondly, to, to in this sector, which maybe hasn't had yet a project of this ambition, such a long-term pan-European partnership, bringing together the industry side, the creative industries, but also the universities, research organization, doing that all across Europe, to put that into our model and well, into a very concrete proposal for a kick. Because if we go ahead with the theme, if the negotiations are successful, that will happen very soon. At the beginning of 2021, um, we could have a call on this. And that, of course, means it is now the time to mobilize everyone in the sector. So hopefully today was a good kickstart in that direction. But we would certainly like to use the next few months, weeks, to really raise awareness. And we would like to involve all of you who were here today and interested in this topic to help us with that. Because I think we're starting still at a relatively low level of awareness, understanding what this could be about and how we can make best use of it to, to boost the entrepreneurship education, but also to boost creativity resulting in startups and projects and products and services that can solve societal challenges. So that's my takeaway, but also my maybe small concern um, for the first discussion. Second element is picking up what the first panel um, discussed, and of course also what the commissioner and Anna talked about, how can we strengthen certain elements of the EIT model? 
in particular the education side, in particular the regional outreach. What I take away is that there is a massive demand for doing that, in particular in the field of education. We've been creating excellent courses in the field of education, excellent programs that stand out but have still not reached a wide enough audience, wide enough number of people that I need of upskilling. I think that came out very, very clearly in the debate. But the new ambition goes even well beyond scaling that up. It goes into changing universities themselves, making them more creative, entrepreneurial, and organizing that at the European level with very, very high ambition is, of course, a tall order. So we will have to, to strategize very carefully at the EIT to make that happen and to really bring in the value that we, that we can contribute to that. So for me, that's a big challenge. Equally, in terms of the regional dimension, I think we heard from Montenegro, from Cyprus, from many places, that there is a very strong demand to expand the EIT community and reach out and cooperate um, with, with regions in Europe. The smart specialization to me is one of the big answers in this field because we can only do that in a focused way and if we have a strong commitment from the countries to contribute. I think this will be the key challenge for the EIT to even more broadly um, increase its coverage. I will stop with that, but not quite yet, because we always say at the EIT, actually we are listening to the innovators and want to give them what they really need. And that means it shouldn't be me talking, but actually those who will be the future of the EIT and the future of Europe. So I would very much like to invite Isa um, from the alumni community, and she's actually the president of the EIT alumni now, on stage to join me and tell us what it is actually. to tell us, welcome, to tell us what it is actually what the EIT community should be doing more of in the future to support the very great alumni and the startups that we have. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, join you on stage, Martin. Um, so the uh, EIT alumni community has grown into a community of not just young graduates, but of entrepreneurs, CEOs, and innovators. And we are already very active within the um, innovation ecosystems across Europe. And yesterday, in our annual event, the EIT Alumni Connect, we brought together over 150 participants from the current EIT Alumni Kicks. Um, and in this sense, EIT Alumni Connect is an excellent example of the EIT community, as it is both cross-kick and cross-pillar, highlighting the diverse nature of our community. And actually, many of our alumni work cross-kick. And um, this is a collaboration that we are very proud of and we want to see more of. And I'm happy to tell you that yesterday, many cross-kick collaborations were initiated among the alumni. And for this reason, we are grateful to the EIT and uh, to you, Martin, for supporting our innovation journey. And we actually hope more of you can join us at Connect and Innovate in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aisha. I think EIT alumni are the best example on how EIT is much more than the sum of the individual knowledge and innovation communities, but that the cross-fertilization, bringing together the different communities, adds something very strongly on top. So thank you for that. With that, we will close this first part of the Innovate this year, which is the fifth edition, as you know. And uh, you can go directly now to the innovation tour, which I think is one of the most interactive and probably exciting parts of EIT Innovate. And afterwards, of course, we still have the highlight of the awards. Absolutely. So, so I'm going to explain journey. how the innovation tour works. Thank you, Martin. Um, yes, it's uh, really fun. It's a, it's a great event, but we have to do it in a kind of an organized way. First off, hopefully, you will have voted. If you haven't voted for the public award, please do, do so. Now you can do so on the Innovate app um, and you can also go to innovate.eu and vote there as well. Uh, voting closes in about an hour from now. The innovation tour, so that's a chance to meet some of the innovators and to see some of the innovations that we've got here and to show the diversity, um, not just the kinds of things we've been talking about in the last hour or so, but many other kinds of things that the EIT is involved with. Um, so in order to do that, you need to look at the number on your seat 
and the uh, number on your seat should correspond to a paddle with a number on it. Can the people with the paddle hold up their hand? So have a look at the number on your seat. You need to follow, for example, if you're sitting on seat with a two on it, you need to feel, follow the man with the number two. And if you've got a, got a 14 on it, you need to follow the person with a 14 on it. It works like that. That way we keep the groups um, uh, organized and the flow is good. And uh, they will lead you around and you'll have uh, a chance to talk to about six different uh, innovators over the course of the innovation tour and uh, each time that your six minutes with the innovator is up you will hear a gong mm. gong come on they're gonna do it no i thought they were gonna play the gong there's gonna be a gong noise <laughs> dong like that i'll do it oh well there we go there will be a noise anyway <laughs> So I'd, I'd like to ask the tour guides to please um, stand up. There it is. Well, that's a pretty good gong. Can the tour guides please stand up? Wave your paddles in the air. Marvellous. So identify your seat number, identify your tour guide. That's the person you're going to follow. In order for us to leave in an orderly way, we need to go from the back first. So the people at the back, you can start to file out. The VIPs on the front can go off on their tour. But if you're sitting in the middle, wait for the people behind you to leave and then we can begin, hopefully, in an orderly way. Enjoy it. I'll see you back here around about 1740, please, because then we've got the awards to give out, and that is unmissable. <laughs>